Catherine has agreed to share with us some of these pieces in the collection and talk about them and how they relate to mapping medievalism. Great. Well, Sandra, I'm thrilled to have you here. You're standing right next to a watercolor here, painted by a Canadian watercolor artist in the early 19th century. And what it's doing is it's showing the kinds of expectations of people uh, and looking at how landscape at the time, or the, the notion of picturesque and so on, incorporated medieval of castles, monasteries, and so on. Uh, and then over here, uh, we have uh, Turner, who is meditating on, uh, again, a late medieval castle. Uh, meditating on the vestiges of the historical past uh, became a very important pastime and interest in the late 18th and early 19th century. Uh, forget the Renaissance at this point, it was the Middle Ages that came to the fore. And if we go even further down this wall, uh, uh, and I'm just pointing to it here, this is the castle that was uh, constructed in the New London on the Thames, that is present-day London, Ontario, between 1827 and 29. And what this was, was it, it took the form of a kind of New World Tower of London. Mm -hmm. So that's really, really interesting. And I have another uh, image of it here. These are early ones from the 1840s. So now we're talking uh, about these pieces here that have been generously loaned uh, to Museum London by the University of Toronto, the Malcolm Collection. And Catherine's going to speak a little bit about uh, what these pieces are and why they're in the exhibit. Great. I'm really happy that the University of Toronto was able to lend us objects from one of Canada's largest collections of medieval art. I brought in works in all media, in metalwork, in bone carving, also textiles here. Uh, this wall here is incredible because I'm sort of showing the man uh, riding a horse, which is, I think, very typically associated with the European Middle Ages. Uh, these are precious uh, textiles that were made in um, uh, North Africa and Egypt in the 5th uh, and 6th centuries. Uh, and they were used, they were, in Northern Europe was only making woolen textiles at the time. And these were uh, eagerly bought up uh, by Northern Europeans because they were seen as luxury uh, materials in which, in fact, relics of saints were wrapped. Uh, so this is really fantastic. There's some other wonderful ones over here. They're very abstracted. Um, here's an allegory of the River Nile, for instance, with little Kuti uh, grasping uh, ducks in the water here. And I'm very interested in this very imaginative uh, rendering of the River Nile because when the British colonizers came to Upper Canada, they had equally imaginative visions of the uh, newly rechristened River Thames where they put up a castle. Uh, so it's very interesting to think about the parallels between these uh, objects made in the 6th, 7th centuries and what happened here in Canada in the early 19th century. Uh, medieval art is usually considered to be an abstract or simplified art. Uh, it was made very legible uh, so that people could understand a message. It was highly patterned. And uh, certainly that intersects with ideas that were also explored in uh, native uh, art production, that is Canadian uh, First Nations art production of the pre-1550 era. There's a lot of animal imagery, it's uh, abstracted, and so on. This piece is lovely here. Yeah, this is a manuscript folio uh, here showing the evangelist St. Matthew. Uh, this was produced in Byzantium, uh, so on the eastern end of the Mediterranean around the year 1000, showing the evangelist writing feverishly away uh, at his scroll here. He's being inspired by the word of God. Uh, and uh, But this is showing a much more classicizing inheritance. This and uh, certainly for the elite, uh, those few who could read, the clerics and the aristocracy. Uh, and so he's showing, certainly, the Middle Ages never lost that memory of the of uh, classical antiquity. And so we brought this work in to demonstrate that. Uh, these very gigantic uh, pottery fragments are remnants from Canada's Middle Ages. They date to the pre-contact era, so pre-1500, pre-1550 in this region, and they show the, uh, the great scale and range of the pottery produced by our First Nations population. These were produced by the neutral Iroquoian nation that occupied this particular region around London, present-day London, uh, around the year 
centuries, um, around 1500. And indeed, here in London, we have one of the most important archaeological sites in the country. It's one of four on the National Register of Historical Sites of an archaeolite which is um, which is a neutral Iroquoian uh, stronghold from the years around 1500, and it was home to about 2,500 people. So the irony is that when the British set up their castle here in, along the Thames River uh, in the uh, early 19th century, it was not the castle wasn't meant to be defensible. But ironically, the First Nations had already built a castle, in quotation marks, in only a few kilometers away in the years around 1500. So it's really, really important. It's well, important. I'm uh, of the opinion that the Group of Seven has to be re-evaluated from the standpoint of medievalism. Because, um, first of all, many of the group members did not originate here in Canada. We always associate the Group of Seven with Canadian national identity. Uh, however, many of them were immigrants from Britain, and they were deeply steeped uh, in medieval lore. And somebody like J.E.H. MacDonald had painted this wonderful painting, The Little Fall, uh, in 1919. It's north of Algoma. It was included in the first Group of Seven exhibition in 1920. Um, uh, was actually grew up in a medieval city. He grew up in Durham, England, which is a city dominated by a medieval castle and cathedral complex. And uh, those memories never left his mind because not only was he influenced by John Ruskin, William Morris, and the arts and crafts movement, but he also continued throughout his career to paint Canada's landscape simultaneously with imaging uh, personages, um, uh, heraldry, shields, castles, knights, and so on of medieval Europe. Italy has not been fully appreciated the impact of the Middle Ages on the Group of Seven. Also, their understanding of Canada's primeval rocks uh, comes right out of uh, medieval romance and indeed the entire concept of wilderness, which we think we brand here in Canada, that entire concept, the way we use it here in Canada, uh, etymologically and conceptually, goes back to the Middle Ages. Uh, that's when the word was invented uh, and used, and we see it applied in medieval manuscripts and so on. So uh, we're really, in a sense here in Canada, uh, continuing to use a concept that was fully developed in the Middle Ages. And people like the J.E.H. MacDonald, uh, Tom Thompson, A.Y. Jackson, and others were painting the great rocks of Canada, which if one goes back and reads the earliest literature or the earliest discourse about the Group of Seven uh, and the Group of Seven painters, uh, they were in fact um, deeply saturated, their thinking was deeply saturated by the Middle Ages because they were equating Canada's primeval rocks with the cathedrals of Europe. Here we have some really beautiful pieces, uh, a mix of medieval and Canadian medieval pieces that Catherine's going to tell us a little bit about today. Yeah, I'm very pleased about this case because sometimes owing to environmental conditions, it's very hard to put, let's say, metalwork from Canada's Middle Ages together with metalwork from uh, made in medieval Europe. But in this case, we've been able to put uh, objects in stone and bone together. Uh, they date more or less from the same centuries here. Uh, so stone uh, objects from uh, medieval Europe. Uh, together with stone objects from medieval Canada. There are lots of parallels in terms of the abstraction and so on, bone simplification. Pieces. And over here we have bone pieces, bone mm -hmm. uh, pieces from medieval Europe here. And uh, uh, our First Nations uh, peoples also worked in bone and uh, made very significant objects, combs and so on, just like one would have done in medieval Europe. So uh, it's very exciting uh, to put these objects together in this single case. We are here with Catherine Brush at the Macintosh Gallery at the University of Western Ontario in London. And this is part two of our series on mapping medievalism at the Canadian frontier. So I'm going to turn this over to Catherine to talk a little bit about the displays here. Great. Uh, there have been three sites here in the city of London where I've um, unfolded this, uh, this exhibition on mapping medievalism of the Canadian frontier. This one is here at the university, and uh, each site is very unique. 
Uh, in this case, I have historical maps uh, drawn from our Serge A. Sauer map library here at the University of Western Ontario that record the sort of shifting understandings of this part of the world, the Great Lakes region. Um, first populated exclusively by our First Nations, and then, oh. then when the British came, uh, they, in, in a sense, reimagined this region on paper. Um, this section also celebrates the medieval technologies developed by our First Nations of the canoe uh, and the snow troops. These were important transportation technologies that were developed during Canada's Middle Ages. Both of them have now become universally recognized symbols or icons of the country of Canada. And I don't think we often think about how lengthy the history of these important technologies is. This is a replica. This is a replica canoe. Yes, and it's made, it's a bridge park canoe made according to uh, traditional practices in the 20th century. So we're really thrilled to have this here as one of the high points of this exhibition. We're also very lucky to have objects here from the Museum of Ontario Archaeology, uh, which is one of Canada's main repositories for the study of First Nations culture in the pre-contact era. Um, we also have in the exhibition, as you know, also objects from the Malcove Collection, University of Toronto Art Center. We also have important texts at another site, Burley, Canadiana, um, which is being shown in our Archives and Research Collection Center at the University of Western Ontario, rare bits of Canadiana, uh, travel narratives, um, books that are sort of manuals on how to build neo-Gothic architecture uh, here in the so on. Um, we also have other lenders to the institution, a canoe uh, manufacturer here in London, the Department of Visual Arts at the University of Western Ontario has also contributed because I had students in our studio program respond and make medieval sculpture and so on. So it's been very, very exciting. Very exciting. And also at this site, I should say, that we also have um, contemporary First Nations artists responding uh, to this whole idea of there having been uh, a medieval Canada. And that's really important because our uh, First Nations populace today, population, is of course they are the continuators of Canada's own Middle Ages. So I was very uh, lucky and fortunate to be able to involve Shelley Nero and Jeff Thomas, who are two of Canada's most prominent First Nations artists, and they have, in their own works, made for this show, uh, are responding to the ideas of First Nations history between the 11th and the 15th centuries. Uh, so that's really exciting as well, that's unique about this particular site. Like you have some of the very old pieces uh, from I the do. 1500s. Yeah, I have, for instance, there is uh, an image of a canoeist uh, that has been burnt onto a piece of turtle shell there. Uh, from around 1300 or 1350. Uh, I also have stones decorated with bear claws and so on. So we know that animal imagery was very common to both medieval European and medieval Canadian culture. Mm -hmm. So that's very exciting.